You know, God's already done a lot this morning. Let's just slightly down, James. He's already done a lot. And, and I really felt this morning before, as I was preparing, that, um, you know, decisions, we all make decisions. Our life is based on decisions that we make. Every minute of every day, you know, right now you're making decisions in your heart. You know, whether it's decisions about to listen or decisions about to think forward to lunch, you're making decisions on, on what you're doing right now. And, um, and for me, I've, I've made decisions in my life and I'm, I, I sort of, I've got these notes and I, I was going to pull some characters from scripture and actually look at, look at some of the decisions that these characters have made and uh, how it's either stood them in, in good stead with God or, or they've failed in some way. Um, you know, at the very outset, and I've got Nathan tinkling away as good, good father, because he is. He's an absolutely amazing, good, good father. And if I can just turn to this scripture, my, the, the premise for all of this is really out of 1 Peter. It could be 2 Peter. Yeah. yeah, 2 Peter 3, 9. And that scripture says... He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's not wanting anyone to perish. He wants us to make decisions in our life that, uh, that bring us back into the fullness of who we're called to be. He, he wants to reconcile us into the fullness of who we are called to be. You know, Adam and Eve made a decision way back when, and that decision uh, was a decision that impacted all of humanity, all of creation. And, and we are the product of, of that decision to some degree. And, and from that decision, God made a way. And scripture, that scripture says, 2 Peter 3, 9, he's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Father made a way. He presented Jesus Christ to us as an offering, as a sacrifice, that we could believe in Christ again, that we could believe on Him and in Him and put our trust in Him. And say, so, you know what, Lord, I trust you with the sacrifice that you've made for my life. It covers everything, every deed, every action, every word that I've ever spoken, pre-today pre and going forward. It's covered everything. There is no condemnation. There is no um, shame that can keep you separated from God. It's all about the decisions you make. You know, when we, when we think about God, and it actually came through in worship, Paul shared from Revelations 5, and I just want to read that again because there's a, there's a distinct contrast of we are, we are bi-dimensional beings. Let's be real about that. We live in a third dimension world reality and, uh, and we, we also dwell in a, in a spiritual reality. If you're born again, you dwell with Christ in that spiritual reality. And, um, and you call it the fourth dimension, but there's more dimensions than the fourth. I, you know, and science is, is, is de uh, declaring that these days. But I just want to read this... This is who you're, you're, you're in the midst of right now. This is not um, just a story. It's not just words on a page. It is power in the page and truth in the page. And it's making itself known to you. It's making itself known to your heart. Your heart, your spirit man is in agreement with this word in some, in some way. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne. So it's Revelation 5, 6 I'm reading from. In the midst of the throne of, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, speaking of Jesus, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, because they knew who he was. They honoured him, they glorified him, they gave him all the glory due his mighty name. Each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, our prayers. And they sang a new song saying, you were worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals for you were slain and you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings. You've made us kings and priests to our God and we, we shall reign on the earth. God is a powerful God. He's a God of all creation. He made a decision 
on that fateful day when Adam and Eve made their decision to present a way for us to come back in reconciliation and fullness of life with Him. To bring all of creation back into its original intent, His original intent, His original mandate. It was all about seeing that fulfilled. And we are part of that mandate. We are part of that fulfilment. And we all get to make decisions with our lives. Everything we do is about decisions. You know, I'm not talking about the kind of decisions where you get up in the morning and what do I wear or what brekkie should I eat? What should I, what should I do today? I'm talking about, Nathan, look, that might be life-shattering to you, but, but to the kingdom realm, it's, 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 you know, it's get on with your life. You're, you're fueling your body to do something great today. And what is that great thing you're going to do today? You're either going to do it in the name of the Lord or you're going to do it for yourself. So it's all about whether you're a selfless person or you're a selfish person. And I'm learning this lesson and I'm preaching to myself as clearly as I'm preaching to anyone else. And, and God, I believe today, is saying it's decision time. Let's close the door on bad decisions and let's open the door to good decisions, godly decisions. Okay, close the door on bad decisions and open the door to good decisions. There's decisions you make in your daily life that impact other people and impact your life and impact those around you. It's how you hold yourself and it's how you display yourself and how you interact with others. All of us do it. All of us, you know, um, impact each other in a certain way. We impact our, our, our own family. If we're in a family and we interact with our family in a certain way, whether good or bad, we impact our family, whether good or bad. Looking at it from a dimensional point of view, do you think we're in a spiritual realm? Do you think we're surrounded by a spiritual realm? Who would say, yes, we're surrounded by a spiritual realm? So do you think that your decisions and your thoughts and your words have power? Yes, they're powerful. So when you think and act in a certain way, what doors are you opening? Now, let me take it from the point of view if you're angry with someone, if you're holding offence against someone, if you're unforgiving. And we cover this off in, in, in worship. If you're acting that way, or if you're, if you're being that kind of a person to someone else, what, what sort of a door do you think you've opened? And who's trading in and out of that door now that you've opened that door? It's not God. It's not the Holy Spirit. Because you've opened a door of offence. You've opened a door um, you know, to the enemy realm that lets the enemy come in and trade on your life. You know, this is the kind of language, Paul's, you know, this is the language we use in this church. It's a, it's a trading platform. And, and we get to trade in the good things of the Lord or, or the bad things of the enemy. And when you're in offence, when you're in unforgiveness, when you're in uh, anger, when you're in anxiety, stress, all those sorts of things that, that dictate how you live your life, you can make a choice and a decision of, of what you want to trade into and out of. So today we want to close the doors on the bad decisions. We want to close the door on, on offence. We want to close the door on unforgiveness. We want to close the door on, um, on sickness, on illness, on depression, on all the things that are not of the kingdom realm. When we think of the kingdom realm, heavenly kingdom realm, where Jesus resides right now, sitting on the throne in all authority, what do we see? Do we see sickness? Do we see death? Do we see illness? Do we see any kind of lack? No. Picture it in your mind's eye. Let your imagination go there. God has given you an imagination and He sanctifies that imagination for His purposes. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. And see that there is nothing bad in heaven. Nothing bad exists there. And you are gates of heaven on earth. You operate between, between dimensions, between the heavenly reality and the earthly reality. You are gates on earth. You can let in anything you choose. But since you were born again and you're a new creation, let in life. Let in the fullness of life. Let in the abundance of life. Let in those things that God's called you to let in. Now, I, again, I'm preaching to myself. First, I put my hand up at first amongst everyone and say, I've not always done that. And, you know, I feel to share part of my testimony. We'll see if it's good, Dave. Yeah, well, this is exactly right. Now, I said to my son, I mean, yeah, for, for the gamers out there, I've got a respawn point in my life. I've got the ability to respawn and renew my life. Okay? And it was when I came to know Jesus Christ, when he presented himself to me in the way that I went, wow, I've, I've never known you like that before, Lord. I've never seen you like that before. Now, for me, I was, uh, I was brought up a Roman Catholic. 
And at the age of 14, I left the church because I couldn't see any reality. In it. I, I got to say that I did love the Stations of the Cross. I loved all of that. I loved the the symbolism. I loved that stuff. But you know, there was no life there, as it were. And my mum, when I was about 16 years of old, uh, 16 years of age, uh, I think mum and dad were going through a bit of a, a tough time, maybe. And, and mum found her way into yoga and into Eastern religion, and uh, and that's what was established in the household. Dad was playing golf and doing what my dad does. And and mum was establishing this new life in the Eastern religions and bringing the occult in. And uh, some weird and wacky things started happening in the house. And so I understand that, I know that. And I actually, I actually went on a search myself, a spiritual search, because I knew in my heart. And this is the thing, since that day of separation from Adam and Eve, there's a hole in all of our hearts. There's a yearning, there's a hunger that needs to be filled. There's, an, there's something that we lack and we can't quite put a finger on it. The new house doesn't do it. The family doesn't do it. It just doesn't do it. And there's always been a hole in the heart that needs to be filled and it can only be filled by God. So on my journey, I'm searching, I'm hungry, and I could see truths within this, uh, the, um, I suppose, the new age reality. But I couldn't get my head around some of their the whole points, you know, I couldn't get my head around reincarnation because I couldn't just couldn't figure out, well, if there's reincarnation, then how come you can't remember your last life? And what if you're supposed to learn your lessons from your last life, how come you can't remember your last life? That makes no sense to me. I, I've got I've got no grid for that. Although some of the truth they taught were there. That's true. They they understood spiritual realities probably better than we do. Anyway, so I was on this search and on this uh, on this reality. Then I met my my wonderful wife Donna, and uh, I don't need to go and how we how I met her, but uh, I did meet her. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was good. It was good. Um, anyway, so <laughs> when we got married, now I'm originally from Melbourne, and I don't know if I've got an accent left from Melbourne, but I'm originally from Melbourne, and I've been over here 20 years now, guys. Settle down. <laughs> okay. But when we got married, when we got married, we moved to Melbourne, and um, before we got married, Donna said to me, you know, I can only marry you if one day you allow me to be a woman like my mum. And I knew Marie, Donna's mum, I knew Marie to be a godly woman, a woman who loved Jesus Christ. And I also understood that I'd had discussions in Marie's house or debates or whatever you'd like to call them with Marie and to stir it up a bit, you know. And, and Marie would get stirred up and would tell me how it was in a good way. But Donna said that one day she wanted to be a woman like her mum, a godly woman. I said, no, I've got no problem with that. I said, God's God, it's all good. Because I didn't know the difference. Of, I didn't know who Jesus really was. I didn't know who, who Father God really was. I didn't know who the Spirit was. I just didn't know. I just said, God's God. Everyone's, you know, all good. My mum's covered by, you know, Buddha and Krishna and the aliens popped in there somewhere. And it's, she, she's got it all covered. So I figure God's God, it's all good. Anyway, so when we moved to Melbourne, my wife, Donna, she starts meeting these born-again Christians. And she's going to be, Mark, it's, it's no coincidence. It's absolutely no coincidence that we've met these born-again Christians. And I'm going, well, okay. I didn't, didn't bag her out. I didn't, you know, I didn't stir her up. I just went, okay, that's fine. Finally, we get invited over to these people's house, this, this lovely couple, uh, Joe and Trish. And uh, they had three lovely children. And what impressed me that night with the bizarrest thing, it wasn't the conversation, even though I, you know, Donna and this lady Trish disappeared out of the room and went looking at clothes because Trish owned a clothes shop. And I, Joe and I are having this conversation. I got to the point where I went, I'm going to ask him the question because I know it's coming, so I'm just going to ask a question about God or something. And I honestly can't remember the question, but I asked the question. And when he answered me, I was just like, huh, I haven't heard that before. And I'm looking at his three children who were, for their ages, I've got to think around about, what, six, four and two or something like that, were extremely well behaved. And I was going, this is unusual because I've seen my mate's children and they're not like that. They're sitting at the, at the bench, breakfast bench, they're having their dinner and they're enjoying themselves. I went, you know, they were having a little bit of fun here and there, but mum and dad sort of put them in check every so often, not in a harsh way, in a loving way. And so I was impressed by that. And so when I... Um, when I asked Joe this question, um, you know, he gave me the answer. Oh, wow, I've never heard that before. And, and we went to another room. We started talking. He started telling me about Adam and Eve and everything I've spoken about this morning. He started just opening things up to my, to my eyes. And I went, wow, I've, I've never heard that before. And all my time in, in the Roman Catholic Church, I've never understood that. Bless you, Elsa. 
it's all family. Um, I've never understood that. And I've got to say, from that point right there, God had me. God, God had me. And it probably took another, you know, we know them as home groups now, and they were saying, oh, would you like to come over on Wednesday night? You know, we meet up with all these other people. And, and I was a bit like, oh, yeah, I'm going to take a bit of a wide berth around that because that's a bit, you know, that's a bit out there, isn't it? You know, so I took a bit of a wide berth around that. I managed to dodge that for about two or three weeks before they finally got us to church on a Sunday. And when I walked into the church, it was a church of about 400 people. Um, uh, and I looked at what was going on around me. I went, wow, these people either are really genuine, like in terms of how they're acting, acting towards one another and the love and the, everything that they display, or this is the biggest put-on I've ever seen. And I couldn't make my mind up. Anyway, this worship starts, music starts, and you know, I hadn't seen anything like that before because, got to remember, I came out of a Roman Catholic background, so I hadn't seen anything like you know, a live band and music. I went, this is, this is different, this is good, you know. And... and um, Anyway, it was in that, in that worship service that God said to me, Son, wake up. This is who I am. And I was literally just broken. I was cut. Because I saw something that I'd never seen before. I'd seen the love of God displayed in a people. Imperfectly, maybe. But it was still something I hadn't seen before in all my time, 30 years to that point. Uh, and, and God opened my eyes and He revealed Himself. You know, and that's... It's, it's, it's an amazing thing when the God of all creation bends over to you, bows down to you and takes your hand and says, my son, I want you to come home. I don't want to leave you where you are. I don't want to leave you in the mess that you're in. You'll think you're having a good time. You think you're drinking and, and you know, you're smoking dope and everything else you're doing is fun. It may be in an earthly sense. But now I want to bring you home. I want to bring you into the reality of, of, of who you really are. I want to bring you into the truth of who you are. And I'm going to start you on a journey. Did I get it right from day one? No. Got tunnel vision for, I did Bible school and tunnel vision. My wife was out here and, you know, yeah. all great, I've got tunnel vision on God. But, you know, things were suffering around me and, and it's a journey. And I'm 20 years in the Lord coming up this November. And, um, you know, it's true what they say, you, you mature. It's almost like you're a teenager in the Lord coming into your 20s now. And, um, and there's a maturity that comes with that. There's an understanding, there's a realisation. And I was saying to someone the other day, you know, even, even the more time you spend in the Lord, it's almost like you go, I know nothing. I know absolutely nothing. Because the reality is God keeps revealing, He keeps showing, He keeps tweaking, He keeps revealing facets of Himself that you've never seen before. He keeps showing you new truths. He keeps bringing new people with new revelation, new understanding into your life. And you just go, wow, this, this is mind-boggling. This is mind-boggling. And some of the things that God is doing around the earth right now are mind-boggling. And He doesn't want to leave anyone where they are. He just doesn't. He wants people to come to the understanding of who they're called to be. The fullness of what they're called to be and who they're called to live as. You are royal sons. You are royal priests. You are powerful. And you get to make powerful decisions. Most of you in this room have already made powerful decisions. You've chosen to believe in Jesus Christ. That is the most powerful decision you will ever make. You have given your life to the one who gives life. You have given your life to the author of life and he will finish your life in faith. He will bring you up to an understanding and a realisation you could never have had without him. In fact, you would have been eternally separated without him. But when you say, Lord, I put my trust and my faith in you. Lord, you're my all. And ever since that day, 20 years ago, I remember going into work the next day and I worked on a construction site and a lot of you could imagine how that would go. Pretty coarse language, pretty full-on stories. A lot of blaspheming. And you know, when they started it at, at uh, I want to say recess, I'm not in kids' school, but when they started at Smoko, the blasphemy started. My ears literally hurt. My ears, I was literally in pain and I couldn't stay in that place. And I thought, what is going on? This is crazy. But I knew it was God. I knew it was God. God wanted to take me out of that environment. Couldn't let me stay in that environment. Now, I wasn't one to backtrack and I wasn't one to make decisions that, that weren't for God from that point forward. Even though I was such a baby, I had such a heart for God, such a yearning and a hunger to know Him more that I actually did jump into Bible school because I thought that's quick track. 
And I surrounded myself with Christians because I thought, that's quick track. I'm going I'm to get understanding quickly and, and, and rapidly. I'm going to extract myself from, from um, rightly or wrongly and hear my heart on that, rightly or wrongly. That's the decision I made for my life. I extracted myself from my group of friends to a degree uh, and, and I, I got on rapidly with God. And that's what I desired to do. And, um, you know, I look back now and I thought, wow, could that have been different? Maybe, but it's not. I can't change the past. Can I change the future? Yes. I can, I can use my decisions. I can use my, uh, you know, my, my ability to communicate and, and speak with them. And, 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 and like they ask questions and I can communicate with them when they ask questions. And I'm never going to Bible bash anyone because I don't think that's right. I'm not going to slap you over the head with a Bible and say, believe the Lord God, you know, because he said, it's not like that. God came to you in love. He came to you in grace. And he offers a hand of grace today to you. And he says, you know what? For those that have been taken to the left or to the right that haven't stayed on the track and, and actually one of the scriptures I had today which is, is quite relevant is Jeremiah 6.16 <clears throat> Jeremiah 6.16 declares this is what the Lord says stand at the crossroads and look ask for the ancient paths ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. So stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. The Hebrew of that reality is, is that there's an ancient secret eternal path that exists. Okay? That's what this scripture is about. It's ask for the ask for the the ancient paths. Stand at the crossroads and look. So can you imagine this is a crossroads? I've come from this direction. I'm at a crossroads now. And I can look to the left or I could look to the right. And some of those might look like great things. Or I can choose to walk straight ahead in God. Ask for where the ancient path is and walk in it. It's a good path. It's the path of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the narrow road as he puts it in a parable. You can choose the wide way, the way of the world, and, and which leads to destruction. Or you can choose the narrow path through Jesus Christ that leads to life and abundant life and fullness of life. There's one thing ticking over my head, and it's the story of Samson. And it seems like a bit of a random thing to bring in at this point in time. But, ran, but, but Samson was a man who was uh, dedicated from before his birth to be a Nazarite. That, was mean, that means he was wholly dedicated to the Lord. And his mother wasn't to touch any fermented drink, and she wasn't to touch anything impure, and neither was Samson. But in his life, there was a point in his life where he came across the, the carcass of a dead lion, and there was honeycomb in it. And he, took, he bent down, and he took of the honeycomb, and he ate of the honeycomb, he ate of the honey, and it was sweet, and it was nice. And he gave some later on to his parents. God spoke to me years ago about this, this reality. It's, it, it, it speaks of sin to me. Sin, it, it, it's, wrapped, it's sweetness wrapped in a body of death. And when you partake of it, you become impure. Uh, you know, you, you infect others, you cause others to stumble in, the, in their walk. Your decisions, the decisions that you make, whether they, they're from offence or whether they're from um, anger or whatever they're from, they impact others and it causes others to stumble. Our decisions are powerful. Our decisions are powerful. And Samson, in his decision-making, didn't understand. I mean, it was before the law where God said, don't touch dead bodies. But he touched a dead carcass and made himself impure, but he'd taken from the sweetness that looked good. It's like sin. Sin can look good. It can be tempting. But when you take of it, it's, it's wrapped in a body of death. And, and, and it, it causes an impurity to dwell in you. And it separates you from God. It separates you. Whether you like it or not, there's a separation that comes. And really what I want to touch on is, is um, Galatians 5. Because to me, this is all about everything that Jesus has ever done. When we accept Jesus, when we understand Jesus, Galatians 5 kicks into play. I love Galatians 5.1. In the NIV, it's uh, Christ's... It's for freedom that Christ has set me free. But out of the passion, it says, let me be clear. The anointed one, speaking of Jesus, has set us free. Not partially. You're not partially free, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth 
and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. Stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. God declares it that what you came out of before you were saved, before you came into salvation, is bondage. Why do we continually give ourselves over to things that were from our old life, that were from our old man, that our old man walked in and thought it was fun, thought it was, hey, that's what you do in you know, life? When you come into a new reality through the newness of Jesus Christ and you enter into a new and living way, you become a new creation. The old self is put off. The new life has come. Walk in the new life. Galatians 5, Galatians 5 goes on to declare in verse 16, As you yield freely and fully, this is the Passion Translation, as you yield freely and fully to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. So as you yield freely and fully to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. For your self-life craves the things that offend the Holy Spirit and hinder Him from living free within you. And the Holy Spirit's intense cravings hinder your self, old self-life from dominating you. The Holy Spirit is the only one who defeats the cravings of your natural life. So then, the two incompatible and conflicting forces within you are your old self-life of the flesh and the new creation life of the Spirit. Again, remember I was speaking earlier about we're three, we live in a three-dimensional realm, but we're surrounded by you know spiritual realm, fourth dimension. Every time we make decisions that go against the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're opening a door to a, a reality of the enemy in our lives. And um, you know, it's like the little foxes that spoil the vines. Song of Songs. We, we can let the little things in our lives, you know, we think, oh, it's nothing, you know, oh, that person offended me, but you know what? You know what? I'll just stay away from them. Actually, that's the little fox that spores the vine because in God's heart, in God's economy, forgiveness is the only way forward. You get stuck and they get stuck. You get stuck in a spiritual bind you don't even know that you've bound. You don't know it. You don't see it because you can't see into the spiritual realm clearly. We're still babies. I hope one day God opens our eyes to the realities of that so we can discern, we can understand that our words are powerful and that, that what we do, what we say, uh, how we act is, 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 is seen by us. Sometimes we can see how it, Im- how it impacts others and we know that our words are powerful. As Paul said earlier, it's hurt people that hurt people. I've hurt people in my life. I'm the first to admit that. Those that are closest to me, you say things, you do things, you act a certain way towards them. And when you reflect, you go, gee, it's so wrong, so wrong. I'm supposed to be a new creation. Who am I to act like that? Who am I to act like that? But today, today, God wants you to close the door on bad decisions. And he wants you to open the door to good decisions, to life, to power, to authority. He wants to give you the good things of the heavenly realms. He wants to give you access to every spiritual blessing that is yours in the heavenly realms. But we can only do it we can only do it with the little decisions that, that turn into big acts. What do I mean by that? Our little decisions of how we treat one another, not being envious. Let me read it out of Galatians 5 because it's, it is so powerful. Galatians 5.19, I'll start with the negative. And what are the cravings of the self-life? This life that you've come out of. He says, what are the cravings of the self-life I'm referring to? They are obvious. These are the things we want to shut the door on today. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favoured, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, being envious of the blessings of others, Murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behaviour. Paul says, haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom realm of God? It's not saying you won't be saved. If you've given your life to Christ and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your saviour, it's not saying you won't be saved. But it's saying you won't get the full inheritance that that is yours. You won't get the rewards. Everything gets blotted out because you're acting in these ways. You'll be as one escaping through fire. You'll have no rewards to show for your salvation, for the life that you were called to live, for the fullness of who you were called to be, of what you were called into, of what you were called to do with your life in in affecting others. Selfless love. Jesus demonstrated it perfectly. 
But here, the fruit of the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its various expressions. This love is revealed through joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness on display, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart and strength of spirit. Never, never, never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Those qualities are meant to be limitless. Keep in mind that we who belong to Jesus, the Anointed One, have already experienced crucifixion. For everything connected with our self-life was put to death on the cross and crucified with Christ. Amen. We've now chosen to live in the surrendered freedom of yielding to the Holy Spirit. So may we never be found dishonouring one another or comparing ourselves to each other. For each of us is an original. You're all originals. You're all unique, all of you. We have forsaken all jealousy that diminishes the value of others. We've forsaken those things because we're a new creation. We've been called into a new life. And today, what I want to do is I want to invite you into, um, it's just an invitation, and I don't want to embarrass anyone like that, but I actually just want us to shut the door on, on bad decisions of the past. And I want that to do that by a physical act. You know, so um, if we could come to the front wall, um, can I please get the music team back up just to, and good, good father. So if there's been offence, if there's been unforgiveness, if there's been um, angst, even if you've carried stress, worry, anxiety, if you've carried things that are not of the kingdom realm, and it, I don't think it takes much for you to figure out what's of the kingdom realm and what's not. But what I'd love for us to do as as a prophetic decree and sign that we want to close the door on bad decisions, those who feel that you know, they've made some bad decisions, whether it's towards others, whether it's towards yourself, uh, whether it's impacted um, you know, communities of people, whatever it is, I actually would, would love you to come to the front. And, um, and as you come to the front, we're going uh, to sing, we're going to worship, but also just, I just want you to do business with God because um, I'll pray, but I just want us to be a people who today... I just really believe that God is asking us to make the decision to close the doors on those bad decisions. So he's asking, asking us to make a decision. He's offering an invitation. Are we going to be brave enough to take the invitation up? And that's what I put before you now. And I, I just ask that if you feel that way, if there's anything in your life where you know you may have made a bad decision towards yourself or others, then please come to the front and do business with God and let him have his way in your life.